Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Pacific Partnerships in Education. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. Pacific Partnerships in Education is all about some of the amazing work that's happening in the region, all sorts of different educational uh, efforts and endeavors we feature here. And today we have a very, a very interesting uh, group here. Uh, we, we have Nina Blanco, welcome Nina, and uh, Dyson Chi, welcome Dyson. Uh, Nina is a former art student, art school student. Uh, she's been involved in all sorts of interesting things. She's a former executive director of Agile Learning Centers. Dyson is a student. Uh, he was a graduate of uh, uh, Honolulu Waldorf School, right, and uh, uh, has homeschooled since then. And we're going to be talking about self-directed learning. Now, I guess the obvious place to start is let's get a definition here. So, Nina, maybe you'll give us a quick definition of what you think of as self-directed learning. Uh, sure. Uh, so, self-directed learning, I think, uh, is essentially, it's to me, it's it's uh, creating one's own life. And uh, by that I mean uh, you're, you know, you're you're in the driver's seat of your learning, and and you're making choices based on your interests. You're making choices based on the things that call to you, um, that you may be passionate about, or what you might be curious about. Um, so self-directed learning, uh, in a nutshell, is is an experience, a very personal experience, a very natural a natural process that we all um, experience as human beings, and just. Uh, you know, no, no different than a child learning to walk just by being in a world of other people that walk. Sure, yeah. sure. Dyson, you got um, I think for me, the very literal term is just being able to, as the learner, being able to decide how you're going to learn um, because it is your own education, therefore mm -hmm. you should have at least some say in how you're going to be learning. Right, and you see, that's, that's very different than what many of us went through, right? Where, I mean, for many years, I went through schooling and was just, you know, I was sort of told, open your textbook here, mm -hmm. read this, learn this, do this. Uh, <laughs> and it was, nobody asked me, do you want to do this, right. you know? Would you like to do this or that? Uh, nobody sort of said, oh, let's think about when we'll do these things. They just sort of told you, and, and it was very structured. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what you're talking about here, and yet at the same time, I, I guess I have to say, learning by its very nature is inherently a self-directed process. Nobody can sort of actually force you to learn anything, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're gonna learn something because you want to learn it. Yeah. Now you may be driven to learn it by external or internal factors, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody might pay you or give you some in incentives to learn, <laughs> right? right. But, uh, so, uh, but, but you made a good point, Nina. This is very much, I mean, it, it really is how we are obviously sort of sort of built to learn. In, mm -hmm. Infants learn languages without anyone telling them, yep. sit down and, and read this book or look at this alphabet and, and do this. Kids learn to talk, right? And they learn to talk just fine mm -hmm. uh, without any real formal training in it, right? Yeah. So, so what, what sort of stimulated your interest in self-directed learning? How did you get involved in it? Um, well, I remember really not liking school growing up. Um, I actually hated it, but I, I had a great social life though. I loved my friends, I had positive relationships with teachers, um, but I, you know, when it came to classes and grades, I was, that was just not my priority. Um, I, I actually remember when I was around, younger than Dyson, around 14 or 15, and I was like, Mom, hey, what's, what's homeschooling? Because whatever that is, I want it. I don't want to be here at school, um, you know. And I, uh, I ended up going through high school, but I, uh, it got to a point where I, I knew I was so clear I did not want to go to college. Um, but you know, after a lot of convincing from my parents, I, I did go to art school, and I didn't know why at the time, but I was uh, drawn to creating spaces and designing spaces for learning and for healing. And I didn't know, you know, what that was about. But later on, after I graduated, I. Uh, you know, I kind of dove back into it and started to research more about uh, designing schools, designing, you know, what's really happening, you know, what's innovative right now about designing schools. And I realized, wow, there's a lot of changes that are happening happening in education across the board, you know, pedag pedagogy, just different alternative education models. And when I realized, you know, ed alternative education is a thing, um, I was just blown away. I was like, wow, if I knew that these options were available as, as I was a kid, then, you know, I think that life would have been very different um, but but all good, you know. And, and ever since then, I really just uh, realized, you know, self-directed learning is how I've lived my life and how I've seen my life, you know, through you know through that lens. 
Uh, and so I've, I've been an advocate ever since, yeah. ever since then. Mm -hmm. And Dyson, you've, you've experienced this, right? You've, for a number of years, you've been essentially a self-directed learner, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess right now you could say I'm a self-directed learner. Mm -hmm. um, but how it came to me, I think it started a lot with, as you said before, I went to Waldorf, Honolulu Waldorf School. And so it started with that mindset of being open-minded to other alternatives, other forms of schooling. Mm -hmm. And then once I started homeschooling, it just came to me really naturally. I never pushed for it in particular, nor did my parents. It was just something that I evolved and adapted into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's much easier in that situation, right? Because you're sort of negotiating all the time with your, your mentor then about what should we look at today, what should we focus on now, rather than a teacher sitting in front of a class of 30 people trying to sort of keep uh, keep chaos to a minimum. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and so much, I think, uh, the, the classic model really is it's, it's, it's teachers trying to control the class and keep it from erupting into chaos. And mm -hmm. of course, nowadays, as you, as you point out, you know, the, the change is teachers actually welcome a certain amount of that chaos in a classroom, at least some teachers, and sort of make it work for them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but it, it, it is a, a thing. So, so talk a little bit about these agile learning centers. You, you were the executive director of, of a well, pilot here mm -hmm. a couple yep. years ago? Yeah, yeah a couple of years ago. Um, so agile learning centers is uh, it's a network of intentional communities. Uh, and I think that these communities are, you know, have uh, this profound respect for young people. And I think they embody that and they, pro you know, they promote that. And, uh, you know, we create a space where um, people come together and simply learn with and from each other. So the emphasis on building healthy relationships with each other first, right? Being human first, um, and then along with you know supporting self-directed learner, there's there's agile um, uh, tools that are put in place, um, you know, and also created by the groups to to sort of uh, make it so that um, you know how can we collectively um, create the space together? How can we also you know, do our own thing as individuals and follow, you know, you know, what we're interested in learning about as individuals, but also with, with, other, with each other, right, in a safe way. Right, but how, how does that work? I mean, is, is, isn't there some curriculum you're supposed to cover? I mean, some set of information that your students, if you will, are supposed to deal with? So if somebody sort of says, I don't want to deal with math, you can't just mm. sort of say, oh, that's fine, you never have to deal with math, <laughs> right? You've got to do something yeah. with it, right? Well, I think that's an interesting question because in, in Agile Learning Centers and in, from my experience in alternative education models, that's not really kind of the question that comes up because the learning is already happening and usually it doesn't look like it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it looks like it, like, the, you know, some students do choose to um, to read out of a book or, or join a class, whether it's online or in person or create a class themselves, you know. So some of um, some of the things that they do do look like formal learning, um, but most of the time, I would say it's more, more natural and more organic, and they're mm -hmm. and they're learning for, from really just being present and be and, and being surrounded by other people that are um, self-directing their learning or um, supporting that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. So th there's no fixed curriculum in these centers, but by, by, I guess by its very nature, there can't be. Uh, but still, I, I sort of wonder uh, how do you assess, how do you evaluate the success of that learning experience for, for somebody? I mean, for me personally, the evaluation of success isn't necessarily your grading. Mm -hmm. It's what you've learned and how you can apply that learning to real life. Because right, those grades, you know, it's nice to get good grades, I'll say that. <laughs> um, but does it help you in real life? Because ultimately, when you're learning, you're trying to further your own, you're trying to make it better for your life, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if that wasn't the point, why would, why would you be learning? And so that's the success right there. If you were able to use that time, whatever you learned, and you can apply it into your life, whether it be it now or 10 years later, mm -hmm. it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, that, that connection that you, you speak of is really, I think, a critical part is being able, and that's what, at the same time, that's really the motivation, too, is you have to help learners see those connections and, and give them a reason to want to explore some topic or some field, right? Yeah. Uh, so they, they understand this is not just an arbitrary thing, but math, again, perhaps it's fitting in with, yeah. you know, if they're studying <coughs> the, the coral reef, you, again, you're, you're probably going to be counting things, you're going to be Absolutely. doing surveys, yeah. you know, all of which involves math. And, right, and there's so layers and layers right. of different subject matters that right. are constantly um, interacting with each other. And so, you know, when something doesn't look like they're learning, 
but really, you know, maybe they're at the beach and they're real, you know, they're they're learning, you know, about the ocean. They're learning about, you know, just being out there and observing and being around the people that um, study the ocean or or enjoy being there. I know Dyson's always had a love for the ocean um, since I've known him. You know. Yeah, and there's no reason you can't learn anything you need need to learn. I uh, had a, uh, a Rindu teacher some years ago who. One year, their physics textbooks that they had ordered before they left on vacation just didn't show up, and they suddenly came back with no physics text for the high school <laughs> physics class. And so this teacher took their class out and started wandering around the campus, and they came across a mud puddle and started talking about this and mm. what was going on in this mud puddle, and apparently spent the better part of the first term actually studying the mud puddle and using that as sort of the basis for their physics class. You know? nice. and there's, there's a lot of right. stuff. Oh. There's you know, surface tension, there's evaporation, there's right. yeah. Everything. Heat, there's entropy, you know, all these different kinds of things you can you can get into uh, and, and discuss. So, yeah, it, it is, and that, that sort of freedom I think is maybe growing now, even in the formal education system, right? Uh, yeah, I think that there are formal education, um, you know, private schools and public schools that are realizing, wow, you know. Um, there's something that we need to change about what the system is, and you know it's arguable to uh, to say whether or not that can be reformed or changed. Um, but I think, yeah, people are definitely accepting of the fact that hey, we need a new a new paradigm. We need something a new model to work off of. And now the question is not so much do we need it, but how do we do that? How do we implement it? You know. Right. Again, it gets us uh, sometimes called learn, learner centered, right? Instead of being mm -hmm. focused on what the teacher is putting out, it's focused on what the learner. Wants, needs, mm -hmm. can do, will do, right? Yeah. Yeah. And how how the teacher can best sort of support that, provide resources for it, knock barriers out of the way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's 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 good. And so this obviously has clear benefits in terms of certainly the learner's motivation, right? If uh, the learner's feeling of control, right? Suddenly, is much more the locus of control yeah. is all on you, right? You you get to. Or say, hey, let's let's pursue this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which must be a great feeling if you find something that's exciting, right? Yeah, totally. Like I mean, like, if you think about it, if I'm in control of my own learning, my learning is my life, right? right, right. I'm responsible for it. Right. So very much it's tied into what I do, into right. my life. Right. So, uh, but again, did you ever find, and maybe this would be a question for your, your mom, your dad, your mentors, uh, did you ever find that they had to sort of help pull you in other directions a little bit to help sort of give you some breadth in your learning? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, I would say, I mean, maybe I've just been really lucky. More often than not, I've been able to decide which path I wanted to take. And my mentors, my parents, they've been able to help me the entire way. They've approved of it right then and there. Um, but I suppose it could happen where your mentor tries to influence which direction you're going. Um, but for me personally, I've been very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, I was thinking in terms of trying to create a sort of well-rounded person, right? You've got you do have to know a little bit about a lot of stuff to be well-rounded, right? <laughs> uh, I've got to know some language, have some communication skills, have some. Quantifiable computational skills, mm -hmm. have some knowledge of how the world actually works around you, right? Have probably some appreciation of artistic stuff, music, etc. But okay. Um, so, one of the issues I know sometimes asked about self-directed learning is how does that work with, with more technical, didactic, uh, obscure stuff? So nobody is going to sort of stumble, well, other than a few random geniuses, is going to stumble on something like quantum mechanics by themselves, right? They're not going to like, oh, gee, I really want to learn about quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, how, how, do you just not deal with stuff like that? I mean, if, if it doesn't come up, you just don't deal with it? Well, I'll start off by saying I actually, I'm not a genius, but quantum mechanics is pretty awesome, and I love studying <laughs> it. And um, but yeah, no, I think that uh, when when it applies to the learner, if it's along their interests, if it has to do with their environment or um, or issues in the world that that pertain to them or their family or their community, then I think it kind of comes naturally, you know, that they that they uh, that they go in depth into something if it, it really concerns them, you know, on a personal level. Um, I think Dyson can definitely speak to this with Project yeah. Ocean, with um, you know the environment, the uh, the effects of global change, uh, global climate uh, climate change, and uh, and just we live in the middle of the ocean, right. right? So that absolutely pertains to all of us. Excellent, and we're, we're going to get to Project Ocean, but right now I'm being told we have to take a quick break. Oh, okay. Uh, 
Ethan Allen here, your, your host for uh, Pacific Partnerships in Education. Uh, Nina Blanco and Dyson Chi are with me here. We're talking about self-directed learning, and we'll be back in one minute. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch, uh, for our mission of empowerment, we aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Aloha. This is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at three o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. And welcome back to Pacific Partnerships in Education. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech studios are Nina Blanco and Dyson Chi. Uh, we're talking about self-directed learning. Uh, just before the break, we were getting into a, a, a sort of an example of some of the sort of the outputs, the, pr the projects that you can get involved with. And, and you've got this thing called Project Ocean. And mm -hmm. maybe Dyson, tell us a little bit about what Project Ocean is. Yeah, totally. Um, so Project Ocean, before I talk, talk about what it is, I'm going to get into why I got into it. Okay. So I'm a big ocean guy, like I love snorkeling, scuba diving, um, bodyboarding. And so when I went to the beaches, more often than not, I'd see plastic on the beaches, mm -hmm. stuff that people leave behind, stuff that came from the ocean. And so eventually it got to the point where I just thought to myself, okay, something needs to be done about this. And so being a homeschooler, I think I have the time I can take up I can take up this issue. Right. And so that's where Project Ocean started, mm -hmm. basically. And so Project Ocean, it's focused on the issue of plastic pollution. Mm -hmm. um, and I do a lot of work like going out to schools, doing education to other youth my age, mm -hmm. um, and just trying to raise awareness and support for this issue. Mm -hmm. Because we are living in Hawaii. We're surrounded by the ocean. Right. And we depend on a healthy ocean for our very survival. For example, like 50 over 50% of our oxygen comes from the ocean. Right. You yeah. use that, eh, it's not going to go well. <laughs> so yeah, it just came out of a need that I saw. OK. okay. And, and what, is, what, is, what does it do? What does the Project Ocean consist of? You know? mm -hmm. um, so basically, I mean, I'm, I'm the founder and the only member of Project mm -hmm. Ocean. It's just an individually run project, not okay. an organization, nothing okay. fancy. And we do a lot of like just basically taking up this issue of plastic pollution, but showing other people, other youth who are my age, who might feel kind of either overwhelmed about this issue or feel like they can't do much about it, mm -hmm. it's to show them and show, be the proof that they can do something about mm -hmm. it, that everyone can do something about this issue. We all have the power to do so. Sure, sure, no, that's great. That's, that's very much part of learning, right? One of the fundamental things is gaining that empowerment that realization that yes, I, I can I can make this happen. I can do this if I want. You know, I can do that if I want. Mm -hmm. that, that 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 option. So um, so this is then very much uh, this gets to the whole issue of sort of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And, and in traditional schooling, it's a whole lot of extrinsic, right? There's grades, there's gold stars, there's slaps on the wrist, you know, <laughs> uh, these different kinds of rewards and punishments. But in 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 self-direct learning, it's really all do I want to do it? Does that feel good? Does it make me happy to, to do this? Am I bored with this now? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, for me, like I said earlier before the break, the main motivation is that it's my life. Mm -hmm. I know that what I'm learning is going to directly impact what I do. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm motivated to keep on going. 
Um, not only that, because I get to choose what I get to learn, it's usually already interesting. Mm -hmm. If I'm choosing in the first place, I'm already, I already have the will to learn about it. Right. That's the main thing. Yeah, you already, mm -hmm. you're already sort of past the big thing. Uh, the, the early stage of any learning is that engagement, right? And yeah. Because you're sort of almost automatically engaged with whatever you're studying. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, uh, teachers often struggle, right, to get the students up to that first, over that yeah. first hurdle, right? where they care about a subject, where they care about a, an idea, a topic, enough to yeah. pay any attention to it. Yeah. And I think also like extrinsic motivations also tend to be that carrot on the stick mentality where mm -hmm. you're striving and chasing after something that isn't you know, something that you've called for to begin with. To begin with. And that could be grades or uh, gold stars or even particular jobs or a certain income, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I think self-directed learning, what that does is that it kind of brings us back into the present moment, and, and that's a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you have people like Dyson and young people who are just, uh, just really focused and honed in on the things that they really care about, um, they're able to really go in depth in that and take it as far as they want to go. Yeah. All right. So we've been talking about this a lot from the perspective of the learner, which is really critical, but shifting gears for a moment, it strikes me this is puts very different burden on a teacher, on a mentor, a teacher, a facilitator of learning, right? I mean, their, their traditional teaching preparation really is eh, <laughs> of questionable worth, maybe, in, in, in this case, to guide a self-directed learner, right? So, so how, do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, what, what is, are there training programs for teachers of self-directed learners? It's almost a contradiction in terms, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I think that there's, um, there's definitely support out there. There's, uh, there are more and more programs coming up that do support uh, facilitators, is, is the word I would use, facilitators, co-learners, mentors. Um, these are the kinds of roles that adults play when it comes to self-directed learning, as opposed to a teacher that's you know, the authority figure, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, the adult kind of becomes this, um, like I said, co-learner and someone who is a guide, right? And, and is available to the, to the learner when they need them, right? And so um, when you have these, these, these guides around you, you have, you, know, you have access to information. We all have the internet, you know? We, we have access to a lot of information. So it's just about, first and foremost, having trusting relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, anything is possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's in that sense, it really is actually a much more sort of natural right. way. If and if you think of it, that is how before the advent of formalized schooling, how yes. people did really learn was right with the older older community members had exactly. a store of knowledge they had gained through experience they had gained from their from their elders when they were younger, yep, exactly. and they pass that along basically, and the young mm -hmm. people discover more and more different things sometimes and mm -hmm. build on that and. Knowledge base keeps growing and growing, mm -hmm. and now, of course, yes, as you see, we all have access to the internet and <laughs> sort of yeah. more knowledge, and more information, at least than we could ever shake a stick at, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the, the the guiding part, I guess, becomes more and more critical, right? How do you help yeah. keep someone focus, get them focused, to focus on the, the right sources of information so they don't get or led? Just, yeah, or just be available to to you know as as someone to you know because we're we're not self-directed learning in our own little bubbles. You right. know, in life, naturally, right, we're constantly collaborating with other people. Right. We're bouncing ideas off of other people. We're, you know, it's never just one person learning one thing. Yeah, and again, yeah. that's a difference. Traditional schooling has been done as a very a solitary thing. Everyone takes their own test. You don't, right. you rarely cl collaborated with your peers. And yet, in the, it's known as cheating. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. right, that's kind of a bad name, right. Uh, and yet, in the real world, a lot of stuff we do, almost everything we do is sort of a collaborative undertaking, right, from your relationship to your friends, to any workplace you're in, to almost any kind of project in this day and age, you're, you're going to have different people. I mean, if you're building a car or mm -hmm. fixing your boat or, or climbing a mountain, right, there's there's multiple people involved in it, typically, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so the, the teaching that, as you said, that you're a human first and building those relationships becomes really, really the, the very central to the whole business. Absolutely. And, you know, again, I mean, it strikes me this, this fits very well with what we know about neuroscience and the brain, right? This is really how we're wired to, to behave. We're, we're fundamentally a very social animal. Yes. Uh, we, are, we pay a lot of attention to one another and you know, uh, follow the lead of, <laughs> yeah. of others, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So, um, how do you, where do you see this going, I guess, is maybe the, the, the next question. Where, where is this, self, is this gonna really like sweep the world, do you think, or, you know, is it just always gonna coexist with more traditional forms of 
instruction? What do you think, Dice? Whew. I mean, for me, I'm no soothsayer, but I see this as a growing trend. It's mm -hmm. becoming trendy because Ultimately, not everyone fits into just one form of schooling. Mm -hmm. So while I don't see the current form of schooling just disappearing, I do see both of them um, having an equal amount, I would say, of um, just people trusting in that, in that form of schooling. At least that's what I would hope for. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. There are people who probably do pretty well in you know, organized school, and I did pretty well in it. It was, mm -hmm. it was okay with me, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I was ready to, yeah. willing to be led. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there are people who, yeah, it clearly doesn't fit. Uh, mm -hmm. Tolstoy has a famous quote about all the greater mass of people take away from schooling is a loathing mm -hmm. of schooling, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, so, and you, you agree that you think it's, it's growing and is going to yeah. become... Absolutely. I think it's, you know, like you said earlier, it's the natural way before uh, conventional schooling was a thing, you know, how many years ago? Um, and we're kind of coming back to that, but also with a whole bed of tools, right, and technology to support us in, in discovering even further um, human advancements, I think. Um, so, yeah, and I think to your last question about the um, formal schooling and, and how that might pair or, or meld with with self-directed learning, I think that self-directed learners, um, you know, opt into you know classroom settings or, or or college classes, you know, or even online classes, at, you know, all the time. It's it's definitely an option. It's 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 an inclusive uh, model, mm -hmm. right? So um, I think it's just a matter of um, how far people are willing to kind of let the old classroom uh, traditional conventional schooling model dissolve in a different way that's useful. Um, and make more space for, for self-directed learning. Right, and, and then you know, it, it leaves the, the key issue you worked out is again sort of the credentialing, the, the grades, if you will, at the end of it, mm -hmm. which are much harder to determine in any real sense mm -hmm. in self-directed learning. But mm -hmm. as you say, it's, I mean, fundamentally, if, if you're sort of happy with what you've learned and you're connecting it well and you're putting your knowledge to work, yeah. but by that demonstration, you, you, you sort of QED have, have succeeded, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You've gotten your A, you know? Yeah, there you go, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so um, real quick, uh, I know you had a, you had a, uh, uh, you run a Facebook group that oh, uh, yeah. deals with um, this. Yeah, Liberating Hawaii's Youth is a Facebook group that I had opened um, some time ago, I think 2013, when I first started studying alternative education. And um, so just constantly putting articles up and new things that are going on in self-directed learning and uh, yeah. And you have Pro Project Ocean has an Instagram yep. uh, link or whatever. Yeah, so it's <laughs> at project underscore ocean underscore Hawaii. Um, you can just probably type in Project Ocean Hawaii and it'll pop up. But yeah, totally follow us uh, because not only do we want to inspire others as part of Project Ocean, we also want to be inspired, right? Learning goes both ways. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, lots of great people doing lots of stuff around the ocean now in tr terms of trying to. <laughs> protect it, make it better, because it need, needs to happen. Yeah. Hey, well, this is, this is wonderful. Uh, this has been a, a rich conversation. I, I've enjoyed it. I, I feel like I've learned a lot here. I, I self-directed myself. Into it. <laughs> awesome. Get myself. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Dyson. Uh, thank you for, for taking time out and, and uh, coming and sharing your experiences. And, and Nina, thank you for being here also and, and letting us know about Agile Learning Centers and, and your current work, too. Thanks, and uh, I hope you will join us then in two more weeks when we're back here on Pacific Partnerships in Education once again. Until then. <laughs>